Dear Muslims, of the most fundamental of Islamic beliefs is the belief in a hereafter and a belief in a garden, a Jannah, that has been promised for the believers. When the Quran was revealed, the people of Arabia did not believe in an afterlife. They did not believe in resurrection. They did not believe in heaven and hell. And so the Quran came proving and describing and reminding and encouraging. And therefore, you will hardly find a page in the Quran except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in it belief in the hereafter and belief in Jannah and belief in Jahannam. And today's brief khutbah, I wanted to remind myself and all of you of this simple fact because all too often we neglect, we forget, we do not take into account one of the most simple objectives of Iman and our purpose of existence and that is to achieve Allah's pleasure and in achieving Allah's pleasure we shall achieve Jannah itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Jannah in hundreds of verses in the Quran. How many times does Allah say, those who do good deeds and those who believe they shall have jannat jannat that they're going to live in forever and the doors will be open those who had taqwa of Allah shall be ushered together in groups entering jannah Allah will cause the believers to enter jannah the same same Jannah he has described to them. Allah describes Jannah to you in this world. After describing Jannah, Allah says, if you really want to compete, then in this you should compete. If you really want to win a race, win a race to get into Jannah. In fact, Allah's entire message is calling you to Jannah. Wallahu yad'u ila al-jannati wal maghfirati bi-idhni. Wallahu yad'u ila al-jannah. Allah is calling you to Jannah. Wallahu yad'u ila dar salam Allah is calling you to dar salam the abode of peace, which is Jannah. And of course, Jannah has been described in many, many hundreds of verses. You cannot, cannot give only one lecture about the descriptions of Jannah. Many lectures can be given about the descriptions of Jannah. But if you close your eyes and you imagine the most beautiful scene you can, Jannah is infinitely better than that scene. In fact, actually, the highest levels of Jannah have not been described in the Quran because our Prophet wasallam said the higher levels of Jannah, in those levels, there is that which the eyes have not seen. The ears have not heard, the minds have not even imagined. Words fail to describe the higher levels of Jannah. What the Quran describes is the lower levels of Jannah. And the Quran uses words that we know in this world. But then Allah says these words, they only sound the same. The realities are totally different. They're going to be brought something that resembles something in this world, but it's not the same thing. It might look like an apple. It might look like a date palm. It might look like a palace. But the realities of Jannah are completely beyond the realm of understanding. We learn from the Quran and Sunnah that Jannah has been created under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Jannah has eight doors. Each one of these doors is for a specific good deed. Depending on which deed you were the most good at doing, you shall be called to enter from that door. Each one of these doors is as far as the eye can see. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us you cannot even see between the, the lengths of the door and yet a time will come, he told us, that every one of those eight doors will be packed to capacity and people will be jostling and shoving, all going into Jannah because Jannah itself will be packed by Allah's mercy. Jannah, Jannah has in it every single desire that the mind can imagine and even that which the mind cannot imagine. In it are palaces for every single one of its inhabitants. In every one of these palaces is, are, are going to be private 
gardens beneath which rivers flow. In the backyards will be tents made out of pearls. The bricks of these palaces, as the Prophet Sallallahu told us, each brick will be made of a metal more precious than the previous one. When you walk outside, Jannah will have bazaars. Jannah will have souks. You will find public fountains there. You will find rivers from which people can drink. Rivers of cold, pure water. Rivers of milk. Rivers of honey. Rivers of pure wine in which there is no intoxication and no side effects. Wherever you look, Jannah is green and luscious. Wherever you look, it will be a sense of greenery and peace. For every dhikr we do, the Prophet Sallallahu told us another flower will sprout in Jannah. Another tree will come. Thus, Jannah has shades everywhere. There is no direct sun. There is no direct darkness. There is no direct heat. There is no direct cold. It is the perfect climate as well. In Jannah, our eternal spouses, the Hurun Ain, and every person will have a spouse, male or female. There will be nobody single in Jannah. You are not single in Jannah. Jannah will have the choicest of foods, the freshest of meats, the juiciest of fruits. People will not eat because they need to eat. They will eat because the food itself tastes so good. They don't need the food to eat. There is no sleeping in Jannah. There is no getting tired in Jannah. Perpetual bliss, perpetual happiness perpetual comfort as our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that in Jannah is that which the mind cannot even conceive whatever you desire shall be in Jannah now sisters and brothers some people when you describe Jannah to them some people are embarrassed about the descriptions of Jannah in fact many times people outside of our faith they are sarcastic about our Jannah and the pleasures of our Jannah and yet we have to point out that when those same people who make fun of our Jannah when they want to have fun in this world what do they do they go to the best of beaches the most green of resorts and they partake of the sensual pleasures of the body the same things they make fun of that we believe in for Jannah they do in this world wanting to get the pleasures of this world so we say to them there's nothing to be embarrassed about Allah created us with desires and Jannah we will be able to partake of all of those desires in a pure and a peaceful manner so there's nothing wrong about the pleasures of Jannah but we also say there are higher pleasures in paradise above and beyond the bodily pleasures there are higher pleasures in fact Jannah is whatever you want a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said O Messenger of Allah I love to rear animals I love to take care of horses will I get a horse in Jannah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said yes indeed Allah will bless you with the choicest of fowls of baby horses you will be able to grow it it will become a stallion you will be able to ride it so the man was so happy another man man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I like to farm. I like to grow trees. Will I be able to be a farmer in Jannah? And so the Prophet described how he would be farming in Jannah. Another companion said, Ya Rasulullah, this person, he must be from the Ansar because we don't like to farm. I don't want to have farming in Jannah. The point is that you will get what you want in Jannah. So yes, Jannah has pleasures, but the point is whatever is your pleasure, for some people, the main pleasure will be conversation, intellectual, and the Quran describes the kalam or the speaking of the people of Jannah. Can you imagine in Jannah, you will have perfect memory and you will know all that you did in this world. Every day, every conversation, every book you read, you will know it. You will now be able to converse and talk with anybody you want. That is of the pleasures of Jannah. You will have perfect memory in Jannah. You will have companions and good friends. Friendship in Jannah is guaranteed in the Quran. Allah mentions so many times that they're going to be reclining on couches discussing with their friends in Jannah is the highest of the high far bigger and better than worldly pleasure and intellectual pleasure you will have the greatest pleasure and that is what the highest blessing of Jannah is the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jannah itself is under the throne of Allah and the higher you are in Jannah the closer you are to the throne of Allah and everyone in Jannah shall be spoken to by Allah Allah will greet them and Allah will welcome them this is in the Quran salamun qawlam min rabbir rahim when they enter Jannah Allah will greet them with salam and they will hear the speech of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and that is of the pleasures of Jannah 
And every Friday, there is no khutbah in Jannah. There is no salah in Jannah. We will not be congregating over here. What will happen on Fridays? We learn in the hadith, on Fridays, there will be, there will be chairs and thrones, and there will be pedestals and massive stools, and everybody will know their spot in Jannah, and they will all sit down like we are sitting here. May Allah make us sit in Jannah as well. But there is no khutbah. What is going to happen? Every Friday, Allah Azza wa Jal Himself Self will unveil his hijab and the people of Jannah will be able to gaze upon the face of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. This is the highest blessing of Jannah. The greatest blessing of Jannah is the connection with our Lord, the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that too will be dependent upon our level and the good deeds that we have done. So indeed Jannah has all and even more than what we can imagine. And O oh Muslims, when we believe in Jannah when we believe in a hereafter, when we believe in paradise, it will impact our lives. This is why the Quran is full of Iman in Jannah, Iman in the Akhirah, because it's not abstract. It's not theoretical. It's not something that is intellectual that doesn't impact you. When you believe in a hereafter and you believe in Jannah, it will make your life completely different. How so? of the blessings of believing in Jannah, of the benefits of believing in Jannah, is that when you believe in the hereafter and Jannah, all of a sudden the troubles, the stress, the worry, the pain, the suffering, all of the problems of this world, they become manageable. You have something to look forward to. You understand and realize there is a light at the end of the tunnel. No matter how difficult this dunya is, when you believe in Jannah, this dunya becomes much easier because you know there's Jannah afterwards. No matter how much pain and how much physical stress and how much anxiety and grief, when you believe in Jannah, it makes this world so manageable and you look forward to the hereafter not that you enjoy the pain but the pain becomes sensible you understand why a woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam she suffered from a severe form of epilepsy she had a, a massive you know a medical issue and she said Ya Rasulullah make dua to Allah to heal me and cure me I want to be completely normal so the Prophet Sallallahu said if you want I will make dua and you will be completely normal and if you want Remain as you are, be patient, and Allah will give you Jannah. Now this is something only the Prophet can promise, obviously. We cannot speak like this. Any, of, any one of us is having a problem, we make dua to Allah to solve the problem. As for the Prophet he gave her two options. If you want, you will be cured of your cancer or your stress. If you want, 100% gone. And then you have to deal with your odds, heaven or hell. But if you want, remain as you are. This disease, this problem, this suffering, Allah has tested you. If you are patient, I guarantee you will get Jannah. When the woman heard this, she said, okay, in this case, leave me as I am and I will get Jannah instead. See, this is what happens when you believe in Jannah, the pain, the suffering, not that you look forward to it, but it makes sense now. And you see a light at the end of the tunnel. Jannah is the abode of peace. There is no anxiety. There is no pain. There is no suffering. This abode is the abode of pain and suffering. As for Jannah, that is the abode where there is no pain and suffering. Khadija, Jibreel came to the Prophet and said, tell Khadija, tell your wife Khadija, Allah is going to reward her with a house in Jannah in which there is no tiredness and there is no chaos and, 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 and fitna, meaning Mecca was a difficult place. The problems that Khadija had with the Quraysh, the constant politics of the Quraysh, the assassination attempts, it grieved Khadija. Life was difficult for Khadija. The constant stress of Mecca was difficult for Khadija. So Jibreel came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has sent me. Allah has sent me, not with Quran, with good news. What is the good news? Tell Khadija, Bashir Khadija, Bashir Khadija, give Khadija good news. Bibaytin fil Jannah, that she's given a house in Jannah. La nasab fiha. There's never going to be any tiredness and never going to be any lahu, any uh, uh, evil talk, any type of talk that's going to harm her. So you look forward to the abode of peace of Jannah. Of the Blessings when you believe in Jannah is you look forward to reuniting with your loved ones. We all lose loved ones. We all lose people whom we love. When we believe in Jannah, we have something to look forward to. We have in the hadith, 
in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah Himself says, this is a hadith Qudsi, that when Allah takes a child from this world, when Allah takes a child, Allah asks the angel, and He knows the answer, but He asks them, how did my servant hear or bear the news of me taking his child? The angels will say that he praised you and he said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, and he was patient. He was sabir. Allah says, give him glad tidings that I'm going to build a palace for him in Jannah that shall be called the palace of praise because he praised me at a time of distress. He praised me at a time of discomfort. And we have in the other hadith, hadith as well, when the mother of Mu'az in, uh, in the battle of Badr, when she came to the Prophet she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, tell me where is my son now? Is he in Jannah? I want to calm myself down. Tell me where is he? And the Prophet وسلم, said, Jannah? No, he is not in Jannah. He is in Jannat. He doesn't have one Jannah. He has many Jannahs that he is in right now. It calms the soul. It brings comfort to the heart. Your loved ones are not in limbo. They're not forever gone. Your loved ones are waiting for you and they shall be reunited with you. Every single person whom you lost that was of our faith, every person, that person shall be with you forever and ever. And that's why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu Ta'ala says, Hum wa azwajuhum, they and their spouses. In the Quran, Allah says, wa We will cause them to enter Jannah along with their children. Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about families together in Jannah. So families will be reunited in Jannah. This is consolation for those that have lost loved ones. Of the blessings of believing in Jannah is that it encourages us to do good deeds. When we believe in Jannah, we become more ethical, more moral. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was in so many a hadith encouraged us to do good and then he incentivized us with Jannah. For example, in the famous hadith he said, the one who takes care of an orphan will be like this with me in Jannah. He put his fingers together. So the one who takes care of the orphan, me and him will be like this in Jannah. He incentivized taking care of an orphan. And so many other hadith that mention a good deed and then link it to Jannah. In other words, Jannah incentivizes us to be better. Jannah warns us against doing evil deeds. When we want to get in Jannah, we minimize doing evil. In one hadith in Surah Al-Tirmidhi, our Prophet ﷺ warned us. He said, the one who is addicted to drinking alcohol in this world, the one who constantly drinks alcohol and doesn't repent, Allah has made the khamr of Jannah haram for him. He's never going to drink the khamr, the real khamr, the khamr that is pure, the khamr that has no negatives, no intoxicants, the sweetest wine that has no negatives, that's up there. The one who is addicted to wine here and does not repent, Obviously, if you repent, inshallah, you will get it. But the one who doesn't repent and dies in that state, there is a fear. What is that fear? The one who is mudminul khamr, addicted to khamr. Allah has made the khamr of Jannah haram for him. This is an incentive for us to not get involved in sins. When we are pure in this world, we will get the purest of the pure in the next world. When we abstain from evil, when we control our desires that are impure, Allah will bless us with the purest of those desires. All all the desires we have, they will be made pure and we will be able to fulfill them in Jannah if we curb them in this world. This is of the blessings of believing in Jannah. Of the blessings of believing in Jannah is that Jannah is one of the main incentives for us to be more ethical, to control our anger, to be more moral, to be able to have the better akhlaq, our morals and our manners. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I guarantee the one who gives up fighting and arguing, he shall be in the middle of Jannah. And I guarantee the one who stops lying, he shall be in the high place of Jannah. And I guarantee the one who has the best manners, he will be in the highest of the high of Jannah. Notice, controlling your anger, controlling lying, being the best manners, it is all linked to Jannah. And therefore, when we believe in Jannah, it will impact our lives at every single level. Our good deeds will increase our bad deeds will decrease. Our akhlaq and manners are going to be the best of the best. And we can go on and on. But of the wisdoms of believing in Jannah, of the wisdoms of believing in Jannah, a very deep wisdom, we understand.
understand the purpose of creation. What are we doing here? What is the purpose of life? Why is there life in this world in the first place? When Allah created the first two people, our mother and father, when Allah created Adam and Hawa, where did He put them? He did not put them on this earth. He put them in Jannah. The default that Allah wants us to be. This is where we're supposed to be. This is what Allah created us to be. He put our parents not in this world. He put them in Jannah first and foremost to indicate, O people, O children of Adam, O Bani Adam, I created you and I wanted you to live right here in Jannah. But for a period of time, and that's why when Allah sent Adam and Hawa down, He said to them, Ilahin, for a period of time, you're going to be down here. This is not our permanent place. This is our temporary abode. Our ultimate destination should be up there. But in order to get there, we have to live morally upright lives. We have to live ethical lives. And when we do so, when we put in a little bit of effort, because here's the point, no matter what we do, no matter how pious we are, no matter how many good deeds we have, Jannah is too precious to be earned by our good deeds. We do not barter, bargain with Allah. We do not hand over our good deeds and say, give me Jannah in return. Our good deeds are measly, meager, nothing compared to the preciousness of Jannah. To give you one example, our Prophet wasallam said, that the hair dress of one of the people of the Hur of Jannah, it is more precious than this whole world and all the gold and all that it contains. You couldn't purchase one hair dress, you couldn't purchase one hijab, you couldn't purchase one piece of cloth of Jannah for all of this dunya. So do you think that our good deeds will buy Jannah? No. That's why our Prophet wasallam said, No, O Muslims, that none of you shall enter Jannah because of his good Good deeds. None of you will enter Jannah because of your good deeds. We do not earn Jannah. They said, not even you, Ya Rasulullah. He said, not even me until Allah surrounds me with His Rahmah. His Rahmah, His mercy is what causes us to enter Jannah. So we show Allah our meager deeds. We show Allah whatever little we've done. Allah will then bless it. Allah will make it manifold. Allah will give us much more than our good deeds are worth. We don't earn Jannah, but we try. We strive and in that trying Allah will bless us for the effort not for the result for the effort and because of that effort Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inshallah ta'ala give us Jannah realize O Muslims Allah explicitly says in the Quran our levels in Jannah the blessings of Jannah will be proportional to our effort this is the Jannah that Allah caused you to inherit because of your amal that you did the amount of amal you did the deeds that you did will cause you to enter Jannah and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us if you truly believe in Jannah it's gonna show in your indication in your effort in the famous hadith in Tirmidhi man khafa adlaj wa man adlaja balag al manzil ala inna sil'at Allahi ghaliya ala inna sil'at Allahi al Jannah man khafa adlaj whoever is truly fearful fearful of what of not entering Jannah of not getting where he needs to go if you're truly scared of not getting there, Adlaj. Adlaj means he's going to exert himself as much as he can. And technically, Adlaj has a very interesting uh, interesting definition. You know when you're walking in the desert, you, you usually stop right before sunset and you take a rest because now you're tired. You've walked the whole day, now you need to take a rest. Adlaj means even when the sun has set, you will continue walking in the twilight for a little while. You're going to exert yourself after a long day of work. You're not going to give up. You're still going to put in 110% and then stop for the night. That's what Adlaj means. So the Prophet is saying, if you truly have the khawf of Allah, you're going to put in not 100, 110%. You're going to put in that little effort, even at the sun is setting, you're going to continue walking. And whoever puts in that effort, that person will reach the destination. You will get there, the first and the best. And whoever gets there will enter the sil'at Allah or the, 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 the promise of Allah and the merchandise of Allah. And what is the merchandise of Allah? The merchandise of Allah is Jannah itself. So if you truly want Jannah, 
Don't put in 50%. Don't put in even 100%. Put in 110%. Put in everything you can. And when you do so, what does Allah say in the Quran? هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ What shall be the reward of those who exert themselves the most except that Allah will give them in perfection as well? Al-Hasan al-Basri said, there is no verse in the Quran that is more optimistic than this verse. Because when man does whatever little man can do, and when man strives to be as good as he can, Allah says, Allah will be as good as he can. And is there any comparison between the good of man and the good of Allah? No, there is no comparison. Yet when we do our little bit of ihsan, Allah will give us infinite ihsan. You really want Jannah? Exert your best. Do what you can. Live moral lives. Live noble lives. Live ethical lives. And if and when we do so, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell us as the Quran says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya fadkhuli fi ibadi wadkhuli jannati. Oh, you soul that is at peace with itself. Come back to your Lord. This will be said when you're about to die. Come back to your Lord. Allah is pleased with you and you are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, you soul, enter into my righteous servants. Oh, you soul, enter into my jannah. May Allah make us amongst those who hear this phrase. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with and through the Quran and make it, may he make us of those who its verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan. I ask Allah's forgiveness. You as well ask him for his the ghafoor and the rahman. Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah, the one and the unique. He it is whom we worship, and it is his aid that we seek. He is the Lord of the weak, and he hears the prayer of the oppressed. Dear Muslims, realize that one of the biggest responsibilities we have in this world that we find ourselves in, especially in this country we find ourselves in, is the protection of our next progeny, the protection of our children. We talked about Jannah. We want Jannah not just for us, but our children as well. We need to protect Iman and the Kalima and the Quran and the love of this religion, the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And much can be said, but one aspect I remind myself and all of you, one aspect that I encourage all of us to think about is the importance of raising your children in an Islamic environment. Make sure your children see the faith as it is lived out and not just hear about it on Sunday school. And in order to do that, two are the primary mechanisms. Number one, without a doubt, your households, your houses, your families, you and your spouse, you must be living Islam. Your house has to be a house of Islam. They should see the manners of Islam, the akhlaq of Islam, they should see the love of Allah, the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in that household. And number two is their school environment. After the house, after the parents, where did the kids spend 18 years of their lives? Number two is the education. And that is why I have always said, and for my own children, I have always done the same. Islamic schools are of the most important mechanisms to preserve the Islamic identity of our children. In this very, very sensitive age, when they absorb everything that's thrown at them from 5 to 18 this sensitive age we want them to be amongst like-minded people we want them to hear the adhan we want them to stop everything for the salah we want them to be taught the morals the akhlaq of our religion we want to try to avoid for them the evil the fahisha the nudity the drugs the licentiousness we cannot protect 100% but without a doubt when you're surrounded by like-minded people it is better and therefore my advice has always been not just for myself and my children, for all of us, we should try our best. It's not possible all the time, but try our best to prioritize Islamic schools for our children. Try our best to put our children in Islamic schools, wherever they may be. And Alhamdulillah, in this community in Dallas, we have so many schools. We thank Allah for that. I have lived in cities in this country. There are no Islamic schools. What are you going to do in that case? We have no choice. I have lived in other cities, one or two schools for the whole city, far drive, difficult to get to. Here in Dallas, we thank Allah. There are so many Islamic schools. There should not, not really be a strong excuse uh, and may Allah help for those that are I know financially sometimes there's an issue speak to the school sometimes there are concessions that can be given but for the sake of your children try your best to put your children in Islamic school and obviously we are so grateful to Allah our community already has a girls school we're now building a boy
boys' school, I can think of no project that is more noble than the protection of Iman of the next generation. And Alhamdulillah for us, our community to be taking the lead, already have a girls' school, now we're going to have the boys' school, then inshallah the stage after is going to be the high school uh, for them as well. Right now it's the middle school. So inshallah, this is of the projects to preserve our deen. This is sadaqa jari of the highest magnitude. So please, sisters and brothers, overall the concept of Islamic schools and then the Islamic school of our community, prioritize this, help out whatever you can. And for the sake of your own children, prioritize putting them in Islamic schools. Again, look at the reality around you. We're losing too many of our youth. They're straying away from the deen. One of the best ways to protect the deen, number one, you yourself. And I'm never going to change this aspect. Schools are always number two. Number one, you yourself and your family, your house, your spouse, your wife, the, the, the parents. Number one is always the family. But number two is going to be the schools. And so prioritize this. Help out in whatever you can. Send your children to Islamic schools. Lots of love, lots of dua. If you show them that in this world, the goal is to be with them in Jannah together. May Allah make us amongst them. Allahumma inni da'in fa'aminu. Allahumma la tadana fi yawmi dhamban illa ghafarta. Wa la hamman illa farrajta. Wa la daynan illa qadayta. Wa la maridan illa shafayta. Wa la asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma aghfir lana wa li ikhwanin alladhina sabakuna bil iman. Wa la taj'a fi qulubina ghillin lilladhina amanu. Rabbana innaka raufur rahim. Allahumma a'iz al-islam wa al-muslimin. Allahumma man aradana aw arad al-islam wa al-muslimin bil سوءٍ فاشغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قائلا عليما إن الله وملائكة يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يا يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة